In this video, I'm gonna teach you to master the 10 most important cooking techniques. I've learned some of these techniques from Gordon Ramsay, others from three Michelin star kitchens, and most from my talented grandparents and great grandparents. Some are easy, such as frying the perfect egg. Others, like balancing the flavors in a dish or plating your food like a pro, can be more complicated. But I guarantee that if you watch this video, you will become a better chef. We're gonna start with basic knife skills. Aside from your own mind and creativity, your chef's knife is your most important tool in the kitchen. Get yourself a nice eight inch chef's knife and a simple sharpener to keep it nice and sharp. Something as simple as this tool right here is all you need. Lots of people also get confused with this tool right here, but this is not a sharpener. This is called a honing rod. As you use your knife, the bottom eventually gets flattened out, and what the honing rod does is pull that back in to keep the knife sharp for longer. To sharpen, all you need to do is buy a sharpener like this that has one coarse and one fine edge. You simply drag your knife through the coarse side a few times, and then through the fine side to finish it off. You'll notice that once I finish sharpening, if I take my knife and drag it through a clean paper towel, some of those shavings will actually come off, which will happen when you sharpen. Most people, when they pick up a knife, hold it something like this. While it technically looks right, this is wrong. You must instead pinch your pointer finger and thumb around the base of the blade, then wrap your remaining fingers around the handle itself. This allows your knife to become an extension of your arm and hand and gives you far more control when cutting anything. Now, when it comes to actually cutting with it, next time you get a nice flat, empty work surface like this, simply practice a nice rocking motion with your knife. This is the way you wanna cut. Not straight down, not hacking at anything, just clean and simple forward motions. The weight of a nice, heavy, sharp chef's knife will do the rest of the work for you. Before we cut, pay attention to one last very important step that's for your safety. I call it the claw method. Let's say we're cutting a cucumber here. You'll place your fingers in a claw like this where that frontmost finger will be used as a guide. Notice that all my fingertips are fully protected since they're tucked in and pointed inwards. Now we can bring this all together at once to start slicing this cucumber. As you can see, my front middle finger is being used as a guide and with my other hand I tuck back my fingertips in that claw shape to make sure I'm protected and have a nice guide. Like most things in life this all comes down to practice and muscle memory which is exactly why I can cut this cucumber with my eyes closed but I don't recommend you do the same. Our second technique today is called mise en place which is French for putting everything in its place. It basically means that by the time you start cooking you should have all your ingredients prepped measured and ready to go. I've worked in several professional restaurants in my life and the better the restaurant the more prepared they always are. These images here are fantastic examples of what I mean by mise en place. As you can see, everything is clean, neat, and organized, with all ingredients either prepped out or perfectly measured out in some way. Later in this video, to teach you about plating, I'm gonna bring in one of my close friends who happens to be one of the best chefs in the country, and he'll show us a fantastic example of what it looks like to be organized in one of his professional kitchens. Here, I'm gonna show you how I prep my mise en place. A bit later on, I'll also show you how to sear the proper steak. We're also gonna talk about how to sear off the perfect piece of salmon and how to cook the perfect chicken breast. Once I've patted each of these dry, I'll hit them all with a generous amount of salt, making sure to coat every possible spot I can. Always be sure to be thorough when you season for maximum flavor. Now, all our mise en place is done for the remainder of the video. Mise en place is more of something that you just need to practice on your own. Keep your workstation clean, make sure you do your prep, and you'll be fine. Let's move on to seasoning. The first idea I want you to erase from your mind is the idea that salt and pepper can fix any dish. This combination right here was decided by a French chef in the 17th century, and it doesn't make any sense. Put pepper aside with the rest of the spices and think of salt as the only ingredient that's truly key in a dish. When learning to season, start simple. Let's say, for example, you're making a soup, even though I hate soup. Taste one spoonful just as it is. Then take another, add a little bit of salt, and taste again. Does it taste better with the salt? If the answer is yes, just add a little more salt to your soup. Your most important tool here is your senses. And just remember, you can always season more, but it's hard to take away. If something tastes bland, you probably need salt, acid, or fat. Once you've mastered the art of seasoning with just salt, you need to learn how to think outside the box. When it comes to salt, for example, there are way more options than just salt to get that same salty flavor. Some of my favorites being Parmesan cheese, soy sauce, and olives. When it comes to acid, you can do way more than just a squeeze of lemon. Some great options are balsamic vinegar, other citrus fruits, and buttermilk. And finally, fat. We might all think of a stick of butter or some olive oil, but again, there are so many ingredients here to choose from. I personally love ghee, egg yolks, and especially peanut butter. So if you take just one thing from this section here, I want you to think of seasoning not just as some simple formula, but as a heat-seeking missile that's constantly adjusting until it hits its target. There's not necessarily a right or wrong answer to seasoning. You and I have different preferences, the same way I might like my egg 
eggs over easy and you might like your scrambled. Which brings us to our next section. There are many ways to cook an egg. Omelet, baked, poached, scrambled, soft boiled, hard boiled, fried, and over easy. You should learn how to cook them all. But today we're gonna keep it simple and make what has been called the emoji egg. If we do it correctly, it should look as perfect as one of those emojis you see online. We'll begin by lightly oiling a non-stick pan, then placing it over low heat and dropping in a room temperature egg. Leave it alone, only adjusting the heat as needed for seven to 10 minutes. After gently easing it off the pan, as you can see, we're left with the perfect egg after doing basically no work. A lot of cooking is just letting the work be done for you. As long as you're focused and making sure you're constantly attentive of what's going on, it should turn out perfectly. Let's move on to how to cook pasta. I'm part Italian, which practically means there's pasta water in my blood. I'm gonna demonstrate how to properly cook pasta, which lots of people do incorrectly. If you wanna learn how to make fresh pasta, I have plenty of other videos on that. First, fill a large pot with water to make sure there's plenty of space for your pasta to move around when it cooks. The same way you wouldn't try to bake 50 cookies on one baking sheet, you don't want to overcrowd your pot here. Next, many people say to salt your water until it tastes like the ocean, but I've done some testing and now think it's best to salt just a bit less than that. We'll turn this all the way up and let it come to a nice rolling boil. Once you add your pasta, give it a quick stir to make sure nothing sticks. The pasta should dance around as it cooks if you've done it properly. And when it moves around like this, it doesn't stick and it cooks evenly. It's al dente. Al dente in Italian literally translates to to the tooth, and it means there should be a slight bite to your noodle. I've added our pasta into a new pot to finish the cooking process, but when it comes to cook time, look at the directions on your pasta packaging and check a few minutes before that. For this, I'm gonna check it seven minutes in. Judge it by how it feels on your teeth when you take a bite. When cooked properly, it should resist just a bit and have a nice springy bounce. If it's overdone, it'll become flimsy, loose in color, and be a bit more pale. Once our pasta is ready, we'll save just a bit of pasta water, which which I'll explain in just a few moments, and then we'll strain it to remove the rest of the water, add it to a bowl, and hit it with a quick splash of olive oil, which will help prevent it from sticking together. Once we later go to add our sauce, we can incorporate a bit of this pasta water to actually help thicken it, and it'll even make your sauce stick better. Equally important to learning how to cook pasta is learning how to make the perfect pot of rice. The first ever cooking skill my Persian grandfather taught me was how to make a pot of fluffy white rice. Start with a nice long grain white rice like basmati or jasmine. The ratio we'll use is one cup of rice to two cups of water. We'll start off by rinsing our rice, which removes extra starch and dust and will give your final cooked rice a better flavor. Add your rice to a pot along with two cups of water and bring it to a boil over high heat. Once it boils, give it a stir and add your lid, then turn the heat to simmer and do not remove the lid while it cooks. This will cook for about 18 minutes, after which I'll take the pot off the heat and let it steam with the lid still on for another five minutes or so. Once it's done steaming, you'll be left with beautiful fluffy white rice. I want to teach you one last little trick here because I like to take things just a step further. I like to melt down one or two tablespoons of butter in a large pan, then I add in my rice. Evenly spread it out in the pan and then add a nice sprinkle of salt. While that's cooking, mise en place. Make sure your workstation stays nice and clean. I usually let this go now for about eight to 10 minutes over medium low heat, after which you should be able to look carefully and start to see some golden brown bits of rice on the bottom. If it smells like it's starting to burn, trust your judgment, turn down the heat. Once you feel like it's crispy, you can begin to break the rice up a little bit and then start to flip it over in the pan. All these beautiful golden brown bits you see now on your rice are gonna give it crunch, texture, and flavor. And I promise you, it turns boring white rice into something special in just a few moments. This is one of my favorite foods in the world. My favorite dish to cook in college was a simple fried rice. It's just a few cheap ingredients and it doesn't require any fancy equipment. I'm gonna show that you don't need a wok, nor do you even need a wok spoon. And it only takes a few minutes to make. Start in any pan of your choosing with some oil. I'm using some pork fat. Then crack in a few eggs. Moving quickly over high heat, get those eggs nice and scrambled, then shift them to one side of your pan and in the other, add a bit of minced garlic and season with a bit of white pepper. If you don't have white pepper, just use regular black pepper. At this point, we'll add in some leftover dry and crumbly white rice. This works much better for a fried rice so it doesn't get too mushy. And to the edges of your pan, add in a little bit of soy sauce. This step here should make you think about seasoning in different ways as we discussed earlier. To get our salt in this dish, we use soy sauce. If you like, you can add in a sprinkle of MSG and I'll finish off my fried rice with some fresh chilies and some green onion. Later in this video, we're gonna talk about how to plate things. But for now, I'm gonna plate this simply in a way you may have seen at a restaurant before. 
Simple and easy. Our next section here is all about how to get a good sear. We all love that nice, beautiful golden brown crust, and you can do it too. I think the biggest difference between getting a good sear and not getting a good sear is temperature. While a professional chef is used to that really nice high heat, people at home often seem scared to really crank things up. The important thing here, no matter what the protein is, is to get that pan very hot. Whenever you're cooking at high heat like this, you need to use a high smoke point oil. I like to use more oil than most people. The reason being that if you take something like a steak, for example, there are all sorts of high points and lower points on the steak. So adding enough oil lets it sneak into some of those little crevices as it cooks and make sure everything becomes golden brown, not just some of the outer parts. Some of the best high smoke point oils are things like avocado, sunflower, peanut, and canola. Once our oil begins to smoke, we're gonna lay down our steak always away from us. Then immediately, I'm gonna press my steak down to make sure there's even contact against the bottom. I'll also turn down my heat just a touch so that things don't burn. Stay focused and use your nose. If you smell burning, turn it down. Once I've rendered off some of the fat cap, I'll lay it down on that first side, once again away from me. And again, I'm gonna press down immediately. I know it hurts when a bit of oil jumps out and hits you, but it's something in cooking that you should get used to. To know when to flip it, I like to look really carefully at the bottom on the sides to see when that starts to get golden brown. Once I think that it's gotten a nice crust, I'll quickly check it, and this is when I can look for areas like these ones here where I haven't applied enough pressure. And once I place it down again, I can push down in those spots again to hopefully get the steak a little more golden brown throughout. Now I'll go for my second flip. What we have on this steak right here is a beautiful crust. And if it was a bit thinner, I'd finish it off by throwing in a bit of butter and butter basting. But this steak is thick enough that I need to finish it in the oven. So we'll come back to it later to see if it's perfectly cooked. We're gonna follow similar steps to this fish here. You once again wanna start with a good amount of oil in the bottom of your pan. Once that oil is shimmering and smoking, we'll lay the fish away from us. Press down on it right away to make sure it keeps that nice flat shape. Turn the heat down to low and just like the steak, let it cook. Once you see that opaque color climb about halfway up the side of your filet, go ahead and flip. What we're looking for now is for the fish to cook through just enough that it sort of closes that gap and you can't see anything raw anymore. And if you're using a proper pan here like a cast iron, don't be afraid if that fish sticks for a bit because once it's done, you should be able to give it a light shake and it should come right off. Here's a quick temperature chart you can screenshot for when cooking fish. And this right here is a perfect piece of salmon. Our final protein to cook, which is a very popular one, is chicken. I will say, if you're just starting out with cooking, you can go ahead and dice this into a bunch of cubes, and it's a lot easier to cook that way and know that you didn't undercook it. But a simple cooking thermometer like this one can solve all your problems. I'll start in the pan with some oil and place it down away from me. Instead of using your hand, you can also get a little creative and weigh it down with something like this, which will give us that maximum surface area contact for the skin of our chicken. Again, I'll turn down the heat just a bit so it doesn't burn, and then I'll pay attention to the edges to see when we get that color. Some people would call that slightly burned, but I prefer the term lightly charred. Similar to our steak, we can finish this chicken in the oven, and when that thermometer reads 165 Fahrenheit, it's done. Once my temperature gauge reads an internal temp of about 140, I like medium when it comes to steak, but here's a chart just in case you like medium rare. I'll set my pan to the side, and after our steak's been rested for a bit, it's time to slice in. Perfect crust, perfect steak. Our final technique and lesson before learning how to plate is making a simple sauce. When I started cooking many years ago, I was so confused on how people made sauces, and especially sauces that tasted so good. And sometimes the answer is right in front of you. In this pan that we just used to make that beautiful steak, it's let off all sorts of beef fat and beautiful little bits and pieces on the bottom of the pan. I wanna show you how easy it is to make a simple sauce. We'll start by adding a small knob of butter and moving that around. And for a little extra flavor, you can add shallots or something like garlic. A wooden spoon will be your best option to scrape off all those little bits of flavor on the bottom without scratching our nice cast iron pan. Once that gets nice and hot, I'll carefully add a little bit of red wine. And after a few moments of burning off some of that alcohol, I'll add in a touch of leftover chicken stock I had for a bit of extra flavor. You can see I've scraped all that goodness off the bottom of the pan. And now to thicken it up, I'll just take a pinch of cornstarch and a tablespoon of boiling water. And once I've mixed it up, I'll pour it in. Adding what's called a slurry made of things like cornstarch and flour are gonna help to thicken our sauce. And as you can see, it happens pretty quick and we've just made what's called a pan sauce. This looks okay, but it could look better. Let's learn how to plate. In this final section, I'm gonna teach you to plate dishes like a chef. And to help, I brought my good friend, Ken Oranger. What's up, man? He's a James Beard award-winning chef with some of my favorite restaurants in the world. And best of all, he knows how to make food look good. And I mean really good. So in front of us, we have all the ingredients for three of the dishes in some of Ken's restaurants. And we're gonna be starting with all the raw materials and going through your thought process on how you put them down on the plate. You've spent a lot of time in Italy. In Italy, they always serve fruit on crushed ice. So this is kind of a play on that at one of our restaurants. Faccia, faccia. It's basically called um, fruit plate. <laughs> Great. Because we want it to be generic, and then when people see it, they're like, holy f 
That's the fruit plate. And when you see oysters, anything on crushed ice, it looks refreshing. I've got some mango sorbet here if you want to fill that mango shell. So you're using different parts of the ingredient to kind of highlight the dish. And to make it feel unusual. It's like the centerpiece. We'll pop on a dragon fruit. Already though, I'm seeing different textures and color. Color is so important. I like to work with like odd numbers a lot of times. It's because asymmetrical is always better than symmetrical in my opinion. That's and you can see how different, orange and orange, but they look completely different. And then we have some blood orange. And now we're building up a little bit of a uh, height off of that. So we're starting to take up some space a little bit, but not too much. We're not overcrowding. So again, we're going for some color. So we'll put a little bit of micro cilantro on top here too. And you can use things like microgreens to lift up your dish and give it a little color and also a little flavor. Yeah, and the height. This is a serious piping bag right here. We'll just pipe a little bit right here and then if you want to just torch that up Nick I think we'll be in business so that's basically our fruit plate for our second dish we're doing something on the savory side so this is the spicy tuna and foie gras tataki just kind of drop this sauce and whatever happens happens here we have a black plate with this beautiful vibrant yellow liquid so plates are very important. Thinking of the actual plate. Yes, this is uh, bluefin tuna. Nice. That we're just serving sashimi and seared for like seconds. So that will have a color contrast also for the plate. Perfect. Up. So I'm gonna go in odd numbers right off the bat. Either go with three or five, just based on how many slices I have. And center plating is another thing that you can't really mess something up. Cause that's where people's eyes are generally gonna go to. Okay. Here, I'm just kind of putting a little bit of this in each corner. We'll usually go in the opposite corner of the creme fraiche. Okay. And then we'll just kind of scatter a couple of those around the tuna. We did talk earlier in this video about mise en place and just look how neatly everything is organized here and it makes plating up so much more uh, fun and then if you want to just put a little chive so you have one two three four five pieces yep. let's cut this into five notice how he's holding the knife by the way that would have been really embarrassing if I was holding it the wrong way right? would have been really bad for the video <laughs> and again we want each bite to have a piece of foie gras so this is gonna give the buttery kind of richness to the dish so our third dish is the simplest of all of them it's an Istanbul ravioli called Monty. With pasta, I tend to like to keep it really tight. This is the garlic yogurt, and then we'll put a little bit of this on top, keeping odd numbers again. We're getting creamy and mild and garlicky, and now we're getting a little spicy, fruity, almost like a raisin. And again, just kind of let it happen. If it's too structured, if it's too perfect, sometimes it doesn't actually look right. Yeah, and now just making it snow with some black truffle. It's truffle season now. Say one. I think we both like truffles, right? <laughs> All right, I think that's probably good. I love it. That was the easiest one we did. Yeah. So now that we've done this quick crash course, let's give everybody watching, what are those few quick takeaways that they should think of when they think plating moving forward? Central plating, you can never go wrong. Utilize different colors, utilize different textures, utilize different flavors. I always love uh, odd numbers. Asymmetrical versus symmetrical. Again, just have fun, don't stress. People stress about cooking. It should be pure joy and it should be pure fun. Brings everybody together. It brought us together. It did. Like a couple in Hawaii, right? A couple in Hawaii. <laughs>